Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's continue our program. Uh, Thomas Cashman from the University of Southern California will be talking about making time for quantum variants. Please, Tom. Okay, thanks. Um, this is probably about the most prominent um, appearance of quantum gravity in my talk. <laughs> um, it's going to be somewhat sketchy and programmatic, but then a talk that isn't, um, it's going to be a theory of quantum gravity that's helped with quantum science. So um, I hope we've seen one of those, but probably not. So I'm going to start off with a little sort of historical sketch of a particularly interesting year, 1927, for the history of quantum mechanics. Um, that's going to be what I'll start off with. There's a very close analog to the problem of time that came up in 1927. Um, and they're going to be talking about relational clocks and um, their relationship to event time observables. Um, that will lead me to a discussion of events and histories. If you collect together many events, you get a history. Um, I'll be talking briefly about um, Chris Isham's HPO, History Projection Operator Formalism, and then trying to relate some of these considerations to the problem of time um, and sort of canonical quantization. And uh, finally, the philosophy of time, um, relationism about time. Okay, so in 1927, if you're interested just in time, um, there are kind of three acts to this sketch. So, um, Heisenberg and Jordan interpreted the time energy uncertainty relation in terms of the time of a quantum jump, act one quantum jumps. Um, they realized that this idea wasn't going to fly. Um, Heisenberg and Born confront instead the problem of time at the universal level, that there is no time um, when you consider quantum mechanics as a theory of the universe. And then Schrodinger comes along and says, look guys, we don't need to consider just these energy eigenstates, we can have superpositions of energy as well. That leads to um, the current account of the Schrodinger equation. Um, so how do we end up with this picture of quantum jumps? Well, in the Bohr hydrogen atom, um, the system has a definite energy at all times. It's in one of these stationary states, and it can jump from state, state to state. And so when the formalism of matrix with matrix mechanics was being developed by Heisenberg, Born, and Jordan, it was interpreted in the same terms. You've got these stationary states with a definite energy, and you jump from state to state. Um, so one of these key papers on, on the route to our modern formalism of quantum mechanics is Heisenberg's analysis of um, exchange of energy between two subsystems. You, you consider a, um, a perturbation on the joint Hamiltonian, and you get fluctuations in energy. These, these are quantum jumps where one, one quantum of energy leaves one system, it turns up in the other subsystem. Eventually this leads to Dirac's transformation theory, basically a sort of generalization of these ideas. Jordan has his own transformation theory. <coughs> Heisenberg tries to give a physical interpretation of these, which he takes to be an interpretation of uh, matrix mechanics, which is opposed to wave mechanics at this time, um, in the famous uncertainty principle paper of 1927. Which is a bit of background. In that paper, Heisenberg has um, an interpretation of the time, energy, and uncertainty principle, where he says that the times of transitions, or these quantum jumps, must be as concrete and determinable by measurement as, say, energies in stationary states. Um, and then here's the um, energy uncertainty bit. If you've got some uncertainty in energy, then the spread within which such an instant is specifiable, i.e. an interval of time, depends on that energy. So, looking ahead, this becomes an untenable, um, but here it is in the paper. Jordan says some similar things. He says, well, we could conclude that the theory gives the probability that a jump will occur, occur at a given moment of time. And we can think of this exact moment of the jump as um, indeterminate. Okay, this was sort of um, earlier in 1927. By the Solvay Conference of 1927, this idea has been abandoned. Things are moving very rapidly. 
Um, so here's Heisenberg and Born's presentation. If one asks the question when a quantum jump occurs, the theory provides no answer. At first, it seemed as if there was a gap here that might be filled. Uh, it's a failure of principle which is deeply anchored in the nature of the possibility of physical knowledge. I wish I knew what that meant. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know. Um, the theory cannot predict the occurrence of an individual event. Okay, so so much for this quantum jump idea. Um, but in, in this talk they say, well, matrix mechanics deals only with closed periodic systems, and in these there are no changes. In order to have true processes, one must restrict one's attention to parts of the system. And there's a paper by Campbell, who's a philosopher, discussed by Heisenberg and Pauli, that says in quantum mechanics, in matrix mechanics, time must um, appear as something like a statistical phenomenon, like temperature. Um, here's Schrodinger. He's um, <coughs> discussing this only to dismiss it, but he gives a nice characterization. Uh, limiting our attention to an isolated system, we would not perceive the passage of time. Um, any more than we notice its possible progress in space. Um, in a subsystem, we would notice merely a sequence of discontinuous transitions, so to speak, a cinematic image, but without the possibility of comparing the time intervals between transitions. So you just get this ordering of events, which are the um, existence of a subsystem in a particular state of energy. Um, okay, so. Schrodinger shows how we can avoid this problem, he argues against it. The idea was that in the quantum jump interpretation, um, we have the system only in one of these family of energy eigenstates. We now try and give the time-dependent Schrodinger equation for one of these um, energy eigenstates. We just get a complex phase out the front, nothing very interesting. Um, Schrodinger says, well, look, um, let's just consider superpositions of energy, any um, energy, any energy, sorry, any vector could be written as the superposition of energy eigenstates, and that gives us the usual Schrodinger, time dependent Schrodinger equation that we all know and love, where we have this family of unitary operators parameterized by time, and um, the time dependence um, acts this. Um, this operator acts on this family that gives us a time dependence. Okay, so um, what does that have to do with quantum gravity? Well, hopefully you'll recognize a certain family resemblance here. Um, and there were certain options that were explored that have some resemblance to options being explored now, I think. Um, so this is going to be very sketchy, but. Um, Following Schrodinger, you could seek some sort of time parameter with respect to, to which the universal state varies. Um, I know that um, Sean Grib and Karim Tableau are pursuing a program like this at the moment. Um, it's this idea of relational plots. The universe is frozen, but we can find relational plot variables, subsystems to define change. I'm thinking something like um, Carlo Rebelli's program of partial variables. Um, and there's another idea, which is kind of a philosophical idea, which arises in Campbell's um, notion as well. Time is nothing but an order on events, this sort of Leibnizian idea. Um, and I think you can see um, something like um, causal sets being uh, related to that idea. So in this talk, I'm just going to concentrate on the idea that thinking about relational clocks in quantum mechanics rather than classical physics leads naturally to actually relational time. Um, so if we're talking about relational clocks in quantum mechanics, we're talking about the quantum clock. Very simply, a quantum clock is a quantum observable who expect, whose expectation value varies with time. So you can read the observable at two times, and the expectation value gives you an indication of the elapsed time. If it's a good clock, um, that well, that variation will be linear. It'll be very easy to read off the next one. So it better not be stationary. Um, so one suggestion by Gambini, Fernand, and Porto is that we can give a conditional probability interpretation of a relational quantum clock. If we've got 
some um, quantum observable, could even be, say, particle position, um, we can treat it as a clock by um, thinking of it as giving um, an assignment of conditional probabilities to the other observables of the system. So it's going to be something like, given that the clock observable T takes a value in some range, uh, delta tau, as I've written here, what is the value of some other observable x? These are the sort of questions that they think should be asking with these relational clock variables in quantum theory. Yeah? Sorry. The first point, how does one know that the expectation value of a, of a clock varies with time? Well, I'm just saying that this is this is in ordinary quantum mechanics. There's a whole literature on quantum clocks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there you have a notion of parameter time and you have a notion of dynamics. Exactly, but then there's no issue about what is time or whether you right. use relational this, this time. Right, this has a very straightforward interpretation, but it's one that's not easily applied when you come to a relational clock. So this, this, this is in ordinary quantum mechanics, and I'm saying um, the relational quantum clock is a more um, difficult entity because there isn't assumed to be this background time frame. So I think there are a few difficulties, some of them conceptual, some of them technical, both. Um, so how does an observable take a value except by measurement? I think there's a conceptual difficulty here. What is it for um, some observable to take a value? Um, if we're talking about conditional probabilities, then in order to satisfy the definition for a probability space, some event has to be assigned probability one. What is that event? Um, and another question, we don't want to just um, condition on one plot variable. We want to say, well, now it's later, so I want to condition on a further um, interval of time, a, a reading of my clock. And that's a joint um, probability. Okay, so in quantum mechanics, <coughs> ordinary quantum mechanics, conditional probabilities are given by Muller's rule, which is basically just a sort of extension of the, um, the Born rule. So probability for A given B in the state rho, um, A and B are represented by projections here. So the rule that um, GPP give doesn't return Luder's rule because no event is assigned probability 1. Um, there's a lot more to say about that. Um, but there's a very natural way in which their proposal leads to event time observable. That's something I explored in my presentation. Um, those have the interpretation, and I think this is a better way of thinking of what a relational clock might be, um, that given that some event occurs at some time, uh, when will it occur? So the sort of thing this addresses, and we're moving quite far away from the notion of a relational clock here, um, something like the decay time of a radioactive atom in ordinary quantum mechanics. So the atom decays only once. We don't know when it decays. Um, these outcomes, outcome at some particular time, outcome at some, uh, sorry, decay at some particular time, decay at some other particular time, are exclusive. You can only decay at one of those. That's enough to give a conditional probability for separation. But that's not the topic of my talk today. Um, now, more generally, there's a notion of conditional probability of work here that can be illustrated um, pretty easily um, by just thinking about space-time. So we have a proposition in ordinary quantum mechanics about a, a region and an interval of time, something like the detector goes off in this region or the particle is detected in this region at this time. And Luna's rule um, gives us a probability Given detection in some baseline region, what is the probability in some sub sub region? Um, now, if we're interested in a space-time region, we can just integrate up. Um, so now we're doing the same thing, but with um, a space-time region that is a sub region. Um, so that's the underlying idea. I'm going to go through the formalism. <coughs> Um, so one question we need to ask if we're doing foundational work um, for a universal theory of quantum mechanics is what is quantum mechanics about? And I take it that the orthodox interpretation 
on which probabilities concern the results of measurement is not going to fly if we're talking about the state of the universe. Who is doing the measuring? Um, on the orthodox account, propositions are these instantaneous projections, Heisenberg picture projections. And we think of measurement of one of those projections as asking a yes-no question. Um, either the proposition is true or it's false, we find out which on measurement. Um, but by making the time of an outcome the subject of these probabilities, we can remove the observer from the picture. So I've argued elsewhere that this provides a resolution of Schrodinger's cat paradox along novel lines. Um, the key idea here is that propositions are about events, not measurements, and we get probabilities for um, particular ways that those events can happen. And so those probabilities, in this case, concerned exclusive histories. Um, in the case I was talking about, the decay of a radioactive atom, um, each of these histories describes decay at a distinct time. So they are exclusive. Um, so what is a history? Well, abstractly, um, a history is a collection of propositions about a world, about a possible world, a way that the world could be. Um, so in this sense, histories, this is for the philosophers, histories correspond to models of um, temporal logic, not modal logic. So um, this, is an, this is, strictly speaking, a frame, but the idea is that um, in a model you're going to have a collection of times, these things here, just a set of times, with um, telling you at each time which propositions are true, and um, an earlier than relation, an ordering of these times. So a history just tells us what is true at each time, and it also orders the, orders the times. Um, so in the case I was discussing, here's a proposition phi t. It's true just in case the atom decays at that time. Um, so if that proposition is true, then the atom has decayed at later times. At earlier times, the atom will decay. So this is what it is to represent a history as a possible world. You get some information about what will happen, what has happened, and so on and so forth. Um, and just to note, this, um, this relation earlier than uh, doesn't even need to be a partial order on the set of times. It's, it can be really quite general. <coughs> okay, so um, to explain a little bit more about philosophy, um, one thing you might be concerned with is defending the reality of temporal passage as a philosopher. So um, one thing you might say is that the coming is the coming into being of successing successive events, and that's what it is for time to pass, for more events to be added to reality. So there's this idea that events that did not exist because they're future, they were future, come to exist now, like me saying these words, because they're present. They get, um, they get to become real, or they exist somehow. Um, in the philosophy, yes? The quantification on that first sentence is some, not all, though. Um, or few, maybe. Yes. <laughs> um, Just for the benefit of the physicists in the room. <laughs> well, here's, here are some philosophers who don't defend the reality of temporal passage with becoming with a big B. They um, support the deflationary sense of becoming, becoming with a small B, which is just the occurrence of events at successive times. So, um, this notion of becoming places no real constraints on what it is for one time to follow another, for one event to follow another, rather. Um, and so if we, just, we can just give a history all at once, and it's compatible with the reality of temporal passage in a small b sense. Um, so as I've defined them, the history contains a series of propositions about the world. Those propositions are true just in case the events they describe happen, and they happen in the order that the history describes. Okay, so back to quantum mechanics. Um, in ordinary quantum mechanics, a history is just a time-ordered string of instantaneous projections. Projections correspond to propositions. Um, the joint probabilities are given by the trace in the following way. So we've got some proposition at T1, and then some proposition at T2, then some proposition at T3. All these things are true together. Um, 
we've got this expression, we just sort of sandwich um, the states here by the corresponding projections, the Heisenberg picture projections, and um, this basically follows from Luder's rule. So we can define a history through one of these operators, and we can define another history. Um, I'm keeping the times the same, but changing the propositions. And uh, Gelman and Hartle um, consider what they call the decoherence functional, um, which takes this, this expression and generalizes it to two separate histories. So here this is um, history alpha, this is history beta, um, and it just assigns this number to, um, to this function. Um, so a family of histories, um, F, where this is zero for any um, disjoint pair of these um, propositions as a consistent set, and you um, define decoherence conditions in terms of this being close to zero, but not exactly zero, where decoherence is assumed to be a dynamical process. So um, Chris Isham um, takes this idea and tries to provide a precise mathematical formalism. He proposes that the state space of quantum mechanics can be thought of as a space of histories distinct from the usual, um, what we might call instantaneous Hilbert space. So again, a history is just an ordered set of temporal propositions about a series of events represented by now a single projection. Um, the probabilities concern which history is actual. Um, which propositions are true of the actual world. So this is inspired by the decoherent or consistent histories uh, due to people like Griffith, uh, but this is more general. Um, and one of the nice things to start is it removes the need for decoherence as a dynamical process. Because these things are projections, um, the histories themselves are projections, there's already a guarantee of orthogonality. Um, but what you're interested in now is finding a meaningful assignment of probabilities. That's, that's a big problem. Um, moreover, there's no need for a time parameter necessarily, because what you care about is the ordering of these temporal propositions in the sense I described in temporal logic. Um, so more abstractly, these decoherence functionals on the HPO theory are just an assignment of a complex number to a pair of histories. Um, with some very mild constraints. Um, and one of the interesting things they do is they suggest that if you define the temporal support of a history as just a set of times at which a proposition is true, some proposition in the history is true, other times get assigned the identity operator in this picture. So in the history I described earlier, that's just T1, T2, and T3. Those, those, that's the support of the history. Um, and we've got this notion of composition when two histories um, are related temporally. So if, if all the events described by one history happen before all the events um, described by another history, we can, uh, we can compose them. That can be generalized to say that a, a quasi-temporal structure requires composition on the sets of supports to form partial semi. So I'm packing that a bit. Um, if we have if we have some support and then we have um, another history that has that support and then um, more times that defines an order itself. Um, and we can think of that as being like quasi time. If time is just the direction in which events happen by having more supports, um, you've got, you've moved further along the timeline. So this abstract notion of temporal ordering doesn't require the existence of a time parameter, and that's why Eichen thinks this might be appropriate for quantum gravity. Um, so 
in this final section, I'm going to try and relate some of these ideas to uh, at least some foundational issues related to quantum gravity. So first, I just want to get this idea of canonical quantization on the table. So classically, if we've got a constrained Hamiltonian system, for example, general relativity, it's confined, the dynamics are confined to a pre-symplectic manifold. Uh, to quantize, we first construct an auxiliary Hilbert space based on the underlying um, symplectic manifold. The physical states are annihilated by the classical constraints that we've now promoted to quantum constraints, quantum operators. And we build a physical Hilbert space by defining an inner product, product and then completing with respect to that inner product in the usual way. Okay, that's the usual picture. And uh, very, speaking very loosely, we've sort of lost time because in the original picture, time was gauge. Okay. Um, but there's an alternative. We can just remain in the so-called auxiliary Hilbert space. So that would be a way to avoid the problem of time if that is just the problem. Um, one way to do that is to just consider talking now about um, just a non-relativistic particle say, is to consider the Schrodinger equation as Dirac wrote it in 1926. Um, the time-dependent equation he wrote here with a partial derivative. It acts on functions of time and space, unlike the Schrodinger equation that I showed you earlier. Um, so this operator, minus W, I'll oh, just that should be over by the way. Um, this is um, a genuine operator. It's conjugate to a self adjoint time observable on the auxiliary covered space. Um, these are conjugates, and so um, this energy operator generates shifts in the spectrum of the time operator. I'm not going to go into that. And all this takes place on this auxiliary covered space. Um, so the thing to remember here is that we've got um, projections that correspond to times because we have a time operator. Um, so rather than escape this auxiliary space for the physical Hilbert space, Granetti, Friedenhagen, and Hogue define a weight on some um, subalgebra of the bounded, bounded operators of the auxiliary space. Um, so this is analogous to a um, algebraic state, which is a, a normed positive linear fun functional. Uh, sorry, it, it, gives the expectation values of the elements of the algebra of, of observables, i.e. the bounded operators, and a weight um, looks a lot like that, but it's not normalized. Uh, okay, let's skip that. Uh, this is the slide that I didn't get to do last time. Skipping it again. Well, just to say <laughs> that there is, a, um, there is a way of providing an analog of Luder's rule in this in this. Form. Um, so in the auxiliary space, you can have propositions about time or, um, or radius, say. If time isn't one of your variables in the auxiliary space, they consider these mini superspace models. Maybe you've got just the parameter that describes the, um, the radius of the universe. Promote that to an operator, and then you've got a set of propositions about uh, radius, just the spectral projections of that self adjoint operator. Um, so you can form a history of propositions for, say, something like location in successive space-time regions. Just think of a collection of disjoint space-time regions. Um, and the way you can do that is by following Eichmann and Linden and using the direct product to form a uh, history of space. So if you have something like an instantaneous Hilbert space, form the direct, the tensor products of those two spaces. I guess I'm going to put so the continuous tensor product space is suitable for this extended Schrodinger equation, and you can form um, histories. Um, you can find an explicit representation of that space for the case of a harmonic oscillator, for example. But the, the underlying idea here is that we don't really need to include time, because um, if we can have a notion of temporal ordering in terms of composition of histories, then we've got a notion of successive events. So the idea is just where it's appropriate to apply conditional probabilities, we have this idea that um, the, the events 
of one history are extended by another history, these partial histories, and from the perspective of um, the first history, you can assign conditional probabilities to extensions of that history, um, extensions being ordered by this, this relationship of forming parts of the history. Um, so I'm just going to say a little bit about these last couple of slides, and then we'll go to questions. So going back to philosophy, um, relational, relationism about time originates with Leibniz. So here's a nice quote from the Leibniz Clark correspondence. Times considered without the things or events are nothing at all, and they consist only in the successive order of things and events. Um, so a bit of philosophical history, you can think of Russell's relational theory of time in this sort of tradition. Um, and in this notion of a quasi-temporal structure of Eichens, it's uh, the partial histories that are being ordered. Um, they suggest that we can think of this as a causal theory of time. This is like the direction of causal influence. Perhaps if that's the case, you might hope to recover uh, something like relativistic space-time as a partial order on these events. So what I mean by this, what I mean by highly probable here, is if, if you've got this notion of what it is for one history to follow some partial history, um, and you can assign probabilities, these conditional probabilities, to various extensions of that history, um, and you've got a way to assign conditional probabilities, then some histories or some classes of histories will be overwhelmingly more likely. This is what you would hope in a relativistic theory. Even if you had a theory for a relativistic quantum particle, you'd hope that these events are going to lead to further events within the light kind of relativistic theory. So you might hope that there's a way to sort of recover an emergent space-time from something that, whose um, dynamical variables are not um, spatial-temporal. Um, so on a relational theory of time, the time parameter depends on the occurrence of events, not vice versa. Um, metaphysically speaking, well, there are events that occur, and the time parameter just sort of um, says what it is for one event to happen later than another, it gives a notion of that. Um, so as Leibniz said, and Campbell, there's no time between successive events. It's meaningless to talk about a time <coughs> interval when there are no events to fill it. Um, so, let me skip that. Okay, so faced with a frozen formalism, it's tempting to think we need to follow Schrodinger's lead, what worked in 1927, um, and find a time parameter. But on the relational view of time, this isn't necessary to provide an understanding of time. We may be better off trying to follow Heisenberg and Campbell in their short lived um, sort of relational theory of time for subsystems. So, um, I tried to explain very briefly how defining relational clocks in quantum mechanics leads you to event times. Um, these are two distinct ways of thinking about time in quantum mechanics. What are ostensibly um, clock operators often turn out to be event time operators. And consideration of joint probability leads to histories. That leads to the HPO formalism, which requires no notion of dynamical decoherence. Um, so it can make sense of successive events in this auxiliary Hilbert space applied to the universal system. Um, and I've suggested, and to be frank, I don't know to what extent this uh, works and agrees with ordinary quantum mechanics, but this Schrodinger weight of Brunetti, Frieden, and Hogue, Friedheim and Hogue can be used to form conditional probabilities in this state. So it provides the added ingredient, the notion of probabilities that the abstract HPO formalism does not give me. Um, and perhaps conditional probabilities for successive histories will give a relationist account of time in possible gravity. That's it. Questions? Any other? Yeah, um, one question is the following. So it seems that a good part of what you said towards the end about possible solutions or ways to address the issue of time is uh, have to do with the uh, ordering, mm -hmm. which is the possibility of defining a temporal order, which is, however, only one of the aspects of an 
of the issue of time, because for example, sure. you wouldn't say anything about having a, a time direction or a time variable or, or anything like that. I mean, the ordering is indeed the, one of the aspects, but only a, sort of a very minimal requirement for having a time. And uh, if, to this extent, I fully agree that even in a fully background independent, different variant, even pre-geometric uh, theory of quantum gravity, you may still have a, a notion of ordering of events. But we, I would still claim that you have no time in that case. Well, that's why I included uh, a little bit about um, the idea of relational accounts, relationist accounts of time in, in philosophy. Um, and according to such an account, there is no more to time than the, um, than the ordering of events. And so the project for the temporal relationist um, in, in the context of, say, Newtonian theory, was to recover everything that the substantivalists could say about time, so to recover absolute time. And a um, project like Russell's is based on that idea. Given events and relations among events, can I get back the real line? So um, in different contexts, the temporal relationist is going to be aiming at different things. So um, if I'm trying to get back Minkowski space, then I'm going to be more interested in a partial order rather than a total order, and I might just hope to return um, the um, manifold with Minkowski metric. Um, and in that case, it would, be, it would be asking too much to recover something like um, an absolute time parameter, which is just not appropriate for a relativistic space-time. Um, but you'd still hope to be able to say everything that um, the substantive about relativistic space-time Say. So, from the perspective of the relationist, it's kind of contingent matter of fact how much structure we get out of um, temporal ordering. And um, so, you would, you would agree with the statement that even if the fundamental theory loosely defined, in which you have a temporal order or any notion of ordering of your states or your events, you still need a, a relational. Uh, way of reconstructing a, a time variable, or a time direction, or a time parameter. Yeah. So in in the um, in the account I was suggesting or sketching, there was this idea um, that um, the ordering could be given in terms of um, partial history. So you've got a history that um, has this set of events, and then you're giving a conditional probability for extensions of that history. And so the hope is that the state of the system, through supplying these conditional probabilities, is giving you an indication of what sort of um, histories are likely. And so um, you'd hope that you can sort of classify, say, you know, what, what sort of space-time is likely to emerge, given that these events happen as sort of seed events, um, and then you get a notion of what it is to to be more probable to happen after these seed events. Um, but you don't need a time parameter to say that, or a time parameter. Oli? So can you say a little bit more about how succession is um, implemented in the framework? So when you have the uh, Isham and Linden uh, mm -hmm. slides up, you have these projection operators which have T in the seeds. Yeah. Um, but presumably, you, we don't really want that. No. So, so how does it work? So, the, um, the, so the slide I had up was just what you would write down in ordinary quantum mechanics with very little departure from what's completely orthodox. Um, and then the abstraction is to, so this, this is, um, the expression for joint probability it's just completely standard. These are Heisenberg picture operators if it ever comes back. Um, so, yeah, there we go. These are just Heisenberg picture operators. You assume the existence of a um, unitary evolutionary group on the stage. Um, and so, Gilman and Hart are sort of um, starting the process of abstracting away um, and saying, well, we can just think of the trace up here is supplying some, uh, I don't know, some sort of measure on the on the histories, and then Isham and Linden 
as saying that the histories themselves are projections. So, go on. Well, do you have a derivative notion of a projection for a particular occurrence of an event? And then if I've got two such projections, mm -hmm. what is it that tells me this concerns an event that is you know, occurring after the other one? So that is something that um, comes from the idea of temporal logic. Um, if you've got if you've got a like a model of temporal logic, then you have a collection of times, you know what is true at one time, um, and a relationship between the times. But they don't they don't have to be totally ordered, they don't even need to be partially ordered. And that's exactly my question. So when they are not uh, totally ordered, or when they're not even partially ordered, mm -hmm. uh, like the entanglement scenario, when there's no relational way to say whether Alice or Bob make it first. Then what happens with the story? I and mean, presumably, if you really want a relational account, then uh, it depends. You get, kind of get one account if you think Alice meant it first, and another account if you think Bob meant it first. Is that what happens? Well, I think let's let's say they're space-like separated, right. and we're we're assuming that we're working within a relativistic space time. Um, then the sort of order I care about is the um, Lorentz invariant order. So only if they're time-like separated are they temporally. Okay, right. So now what happens if it is like that? What happens if it's Then there's nothing to say about their order. Then they're not it's not true that Alice measures before okay, Bob, it's not true that she measures after Bob. Now the story, does the history story then? Does does it is it really independent of that which happens first or not? Uh, independent of the, the history. Well it, it depends on so your your proposition um, sorry, your, your projection is going to contain all these propositions about what is true um, at a time. And so times don't have to be related by the earlier than relation. Um, one, one thing that um, people who do tense logic like to explore is this idea that we can have branching time, in which case um, not every time is comparable. It doesn't have to be the case that one is after the other. Um, or vice versa. So, this is a very general notion of what it is um, to be a time. To be a time is just to sort of be placed with in this structure where you're related to sometimes, other times you might not be related to. So, it's a very abstract notion of what a time is. Okay, well, please join me in thanking you.